最近不太动，伤负超过了百分之二十。喂，黑黑狼，黑狼。Long ago, this is what they felt like when it happened, and today. It's how we should feel too, because what it meant for them, it means for us. Good morning, Metro. Come on, let's rush to our feet. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Anybody ready to party for Jesus? Make some noise! Risen, He's risen, forever glorified. Risen, He's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is alive. Come on, y'all! Everybody, jump around! 
Jesus. There's a song that says, Hallelujah, you have won the victory. Anybody looking for God for some things and you think that there's no way possible that anything can happen or anything can happen for your life, but when you rely on God and you just trust in Him that He already won the victory for you and He won the victory for you and He won the victory for you. Somebody give God a praise because He already won the victory. I'm going to do a little test. What's the highest praise? I didn't believe that. What is the highest praise? Now say it like you mean it. What is the highest praise? Now somebody give God a hallelujah praise in this place. Come on, let's worship him. Let's worship him. This is Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for rising among us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to your name. I just want everybody to slip their hands up. And we're just going to worship him. We're going to encounter God real quick. If that's all right, that's what we came to do is to encounter the presence of the mighty God that we serve. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. You have won the victory.
started here this morning. You've got a lot more to look forward to. Thank you for being with us today on this Easter Sunday. If you're visiting us for the first time, we just want to acknowledge that may never be easy, but we want you to feel welcome here. We want you to receive whatever God has for you. Could we just thank these guys again one more time, please? You know, they, they're kind of the they're sort of the upfront ones here today, and they have been practicing for hours and hours and hours. But yesterday, uh, we had dozens of people that were here all day long getting set up, getting ready for this. We move our entire worship system from one place to another one time a year uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, and there's hundreds of hours of work that goes into this, and it's only for one reason. It's not because we just want to do a bunch of work. It's because of the word resurrection. We're here today because of the resurrection. Jesus talked about the resurrection. He talked about his own resurrection, and it made his best friends nervous. One time they even took him aside and said, Jesus, you got to quit talking like that. Because, see, they were afraid if the resurrection didn't happen, then everything that Jesus had said and done would be discredited. And he'd just be another lying politician. But the resurrection happened. We celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday. We've been preparing for this all week long. And this is the day that we say, hallelujah, he is risen. So church, the good news is this. Everything that Jesus said 
everything he taught, everything he did was true. It was steadfast. It is trustworthy. We can stand on the truth of what Jesus said. Nothing is suspect. No politics. Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that was God's stamp of approval. His acknowledgement of everything that Jesus had said and done up until that point. Why is this important for us today? There's too many reasons to recount, but let me just share one with you. In a few moments, our lead pastor, Peter Ahn, is going to come up front, and he's going to share some truth with you from the lips of Jesus. It may be hard truth for some of us to receive, but it's truth. And when we hear the truth of Jesus Christ, we better pay attention. We better allow God to work in us and through us as we receive that truth. Can we pray together, please? God, it's our privilege and honor to be gathered together here this morning. We thank you for this place. We thank you for people that have worked very hard that we could be here. We thank you for the truth of the risen Son of God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that he didn't just make a cameo appearance after his resurrection. No, he, he hung out for over a month and spent lots of time with people, hundreds of people, proving that he indeed rose from the dead. And God, because of that resurrection, we can be here today. Because of that resurrection, we call ourselves followers of you. Because of what Jesus did, he brought us back into right relationship with you. There is no way that we can overstate the resurrection. So God, thank you for this service. Thank you for this time. Help us to be alert to everything you have for us, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Um, we have a vision statement here at Metro Community Church that we summarize in the word transformation. And when we say that, we are acknowledging that God is at work in us. He's, he's doing something in us. He is finishing the good work that he began and that he promised that he would finish. Being here today is part of that. Being involved in the life of this church or another church is part of that transformation. Because God doesn't just change us for change's sake. No, he changes us to prepare us to go out and help other people receive transformation. Because, guys, we live in a world that is absolutely desperate for transformation. So as Pastor Peter opens the word to us today, open yourself up to the truth that God has for you. Uh, you got a bulletin when you came in the door, and in that bulletin is a little tear-off communication card. Could you just do me a favor and take that out for a moment, please? If you're a first or second time visitor here, uh, there's a box you can check off for that. This is, this is one way we can stay connected to you and, and serve you. There's a place for prayer requests on that, which we take very seriously and our staff prays for every week. Uh, so let me just give you the next 15, 20 seconds to fill that card out. If you are a first time visitor, just fill out whatever information you're comfortable with. Just keep that uh, communication card close by. Pastor Peter is going to refer to that at the end of his sermon, and you'll want to be able to grab that once again. Uh, we try to make the other activities in the life of Metro Community Church very available to everybody, so we, we put it in many different formats. You've got one in your hand with a bulletin. We update this every week. This is not stale information. We also have our website that you can go to anytime to get updated information. There's all kinds of opportunities to serve, to be in small groups, uh, just to be active in other parts of this church. And you need to uh, take a look at those. We also send out a weekly email, just one, once a week on Thursday, our e-blast. If you're not getting it, check that box on your communication card. Make sure we have a current email address for you, and we will send that to you. We promise not to fill up your inbox with stuff, but once a week, we just want to reach out to you and uh, touch base with you. If you are a first-time visitor, would you just stop and, and, and say hi to us as you go out the door there? Some of our pastors are going to be at a table there. They've got a gift that they would love to give you. They would love to answer any questions that you might have about this church. They'll give you some info about the church. Uh, but more than anything, just, just to chat, just to say hi, and let us thank you for being with us here today. If you've got little ones in the service, if they become restless, you can go to the nursery room just out these doors to the right. Just keep following the hall. And there's a, an opportunity there to, I'm sorry, go out the doors and turn left. I'm sending you to Metro Kids and stuff that way. Go out the door and turn left. You can see the service live in there, and your kids can, can be uh, 
noisy if they if they need to be. If you have a cell phone, just put it on silent, please. And I'm just going to invite you to uh, go ahead and stand up and uh, greet the folks around you. Thanks.
Never disobey. I know you think there's no hope, but that ain't true. Jesus saved. I know you're feeling regret. Like I brought this all on myself. Like I messed it up big time. And this time I don't deserve God's help. Thinking how can God forgive me after knowing what I did. After knowing that I hid from him and I stayed away and backslid. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus came for the weak. Jesus came to get good news and to set the captives free. Jesus came for the poor. Jesus came with the keys. Jesus came to remove the chains of the prisoners. Everybody's got a plain page. A story they write and today. A wall that they are climbing. You can carry the past on your shoulders. Or you can start over. Regret. No matter what you're going through, Jesus. He gave it all to say. On his shoulders, so you can start over. So his love is deeper than the ocean floor. Run to his arms like an open door. God the Father sent the Son, so make it come and be free. Ain't gotta run no more. Come to me, all who are weary. With heavy burdens, I'll give you rest. Separated you from your sin. As far as the east is from the west. Gone in a sea of forgetfulness. What sin? What offense? And when them waves come crashing in, I'll calm the winds in your defense. So whatever it is that you've done, he put that punishment on his son. You'll never come under his condemnation. Caught the sin and sin and his accusation. So dry your eyes, lift up your head. Hallelujah, God's not dead. Stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop. I need you to understand that this is not just a performance. I need you to understand that this is church. I need you to understand that if you came in here today, if you came in here today thinking this was just going to be a regular Easter service, the door's back there. We're going to invite the Spirit of God into this place. And so if you don't know Jesus, I need you to feel me. If you came in here and you forgot what he's done, I need you to feel me. I, I, if you came in here forgetting what he has done on the cross then I need you to understand what I'm about to say. I said his love is deeper than the ocean floor. I said his love is deeper than the ocean floor. Run to his arms like an open door. 
God the Father sent the Son so man can come feet ain't gotta run no more. Come to me, all who are weary. With heavy burdens, I'll give you rest. Separated you from your sin. As far as the east is from the west, gone in the sea of forgetfulness. What sin? What offense? And when them waves come crashing in, I'll calm the winds in your defense. So whatever it is that you've done, he put that punishment on his son. You'll never come under his condemnation, conquer sin, the saying and his accusation. So dry your eyes, lift up your head. Hallelujah, God is not dead. Plus he gave us his peace and he took our guilt on the cross instead. Took our place and now we embrace a clean slate with the eyes of faith. Metro, I'm feeling love, I'm feeling love. It's never too late, Metro. I'm feeling love, I'm feeling love. It's never too late, Metro. Let's go, let's go. Everybody's got a blank page. A story they write it today. I want it to climb it. You can carry Stand the up past your feet, on your Metro. shoulder. Or you can start over. Regret. No matter what you're going through, Jesus, he gave it all to save you. He carried the cross on his shoulder. Oh, you can start over. Talk to him. Everybody's got a blank page, a story they write it today. A wall that they're climbing, you can carry the past on your shoulder. Oh, what? oh, you can start over, regret, no matter what you've gone through, Jesus, he gave it all to save you, he carried his cross on his shoulder, so you can start over. Father God, we invite you into this place this morning, Lord God. This is not just a performance, Lord God. This is not just a regular presentation, Lord God. We do this to bring glory to your name, Lord God. Oh, that you might open the eyes of the hearts of the people that you've brought here before you this morning to let them understand, let them know that your work on the cross was finished and today the check is cleared. You have resurrected from the dead. Our sins have been paid for and now we can come before your presence with boldness, with confidence, Lord God, that we today can start over, Lord God, regardless of what we've done, regardless of the things that we've been through, regardless how we sinned against you, Holy God, today we can start over. Today we can start over, Lord God. So I commit this service into your presence, Lord God, for the glory of your name and for the joy of our hearts. And the church of God said... I realize you can't teach cool. I wish, I wish I could take a lesson from you guys. Man, that was awesome, man. I honestly, I said this in the first service, but it kind of feels a little anticlimactic that I got to come up here now and impart to you God's word. But happy Easter, Metro. Happy Easter. I want to thank you for those joining us online. Welcome to online community. Those in the nursery, hi. And uh, to all of our first and second time visitors, especially our first time visitors, welcome to this church. We're so thankful that you decided to take out some time to join us in this powerful service that we call our Easter service. And we're excited that you're here today because we've been praying, we've been hoping that God will continue to do some amazing things in our lives, in the life of our church, but also in your life. And that's what we're hoping for. And that's what we're hoping and praying for. So before we get started, can we just bow our heads for a moment of prayer? I want to give you just a brief moment, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, asking God to come and speak to you today. And then I'll pray for us. So God, we thank you already for an amazing service. We got to experience and taste of what a day like this really represents for all of us. And so God, I pray that even now at this moment that you would come and speak to each and every one of us in the way that you want us to, God. I pray that you would open up the word and God, that we would be able to see so clearly, maybe even for some in this room who've never seen it, I pray that they would see it for the very first time. And even those that are home right now or traveling and they're logging on watching, God, I pray that wherever they are in their home, in their room, that it will be a holy sanctuary for them. 
that they would be in your presence and that you would move in a powerful way. So thank you so much, Lord, for dying for us on the cross, resurrected from the dead, giving us this opportunity to come and celebrate the goodness of what Easter means. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. A few months ago, the men's ministry had a, a real fantastic event. I think one of the best events we've ever had here at Metro called the Father-Daughter Dance. And it was such a, a great event. And if you're a dad here and you took your child there, I, I hope it was as special it was for you as, as it was for me. I, I signed up both my daughters and I decided to have both of them go. And the men's ministry, they kept sending out a lot of emails preparing the fathers to make sure that they come to that event with a piece of jewelry that they would buy. It would be a, a, a promise ring or a promise bracelet or a promise necklace. And it would be an event that we would sit with our daughter and we would get on our knees and promise them that we would love them forever, that we would be there to support them, that we would do our best to love their mother to the best of our ability. And it was one of those amazing moments where as, as the dads got on their knees, I mean, I got choked up. I was trying to hold back. My daughter, Christina, is like the softie, so she started like holding back her tears. I could see it. And then when I gave them the necklace, I brought them this beautiful sterling silver sapphire stone necklace. I showed it to them. It was in the shape of a heart. They were both so deeply touched and overwhelmed. And I could just see it in their face because they had no idea that I would get them such a gift. And it wasn't the gift that was touching for them, but it was what that gift represented. That this was a, a jewelry, a piece of jewelry that wasn't just to help them to look better, but this was a piece of jewelry that was supposed to uh, remind them of the promise and the covenant that I had made with them. And it was a special evening, it really was. Well, um, this past week on Wednesday, my daughter came home, Kayla came home from school, and I came home from work, and I was in my room, and she had a very flustered, nervous look on her face. She came to my room, and she said, Daddy, I lost my necklace. And I, my natural reaction was, what? <laughs> How dare you, girl? But I said, what happened? She said, I took it off for gym class, I put it in my locker, and it's gone. And then she just started crying uncontrollably to the point where she couldn't even talk. She was trying to talk. She was trying to make her words. Said, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the principal's office and talk to the principal. It's not at the lost and found. And I just said to her, I said, it's okay, Kayla. It's okay. Daddy's going to buy you another one, I promise. And she said, no, 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 it's too expensive. You don't have to buy me another one. And I just broke my heart. I said, no, no, I'll buy you another one. Don't worry. What would have happened if she never told me? And one day we were sitting at the dinner table and I just kind of looked at her neck and I didn't see the necklace. And I said, hey, uh, where's the necklace that I got you? And she said, oh, well, I lost it at the gym, at gym class. We'd be preparing for a funeral. <laughs> I'd kill her. I would. I'm like, what? Do you know what that necklace means to me and what it should mean to you? You see, my daughter was so flustered and she was honestly distraught. And I thought about what it was like for her to be at school that entire day to realize that she lost that necklace. Because she knew she had a responsibility for that necklace. That she was supposed to watch it and care for it because it represented and affirmed the promise that I made with her a few months ago. Easter Sunday is God's thundering statement that he loves you, that he cares for you. And no matter what you've gone through in your life, whatever death situation that you might be in or you've been in the past, that God could breathe life into it because he sent his son to die for you on the cross, to resurrect from the dead. And as a result of it, we have life. Amen? What are we to do with that covenant? With that thundering statement and promise that God has made for us? You see, for many of us, it goes one year out the other. For many of us, we come on this day to sort of participate in a historical activity that we sort of give assent to and we agree to, but has it really permeated the depth of our soul and changed the way we live our life? You see, this story that we come here to celebrate, the resurrection of Jesus, it's God's statement to say that he loves you, he cares for you. Your sins have been completely forgiven. But there's a responsibility on our part. We can't just say that's cool and we just walk out of here and just kind of live our life every single day as if it doesn't matter. You see, we love to come here today on this Easter Sunday because we like to declare, Paul teaches us this in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that because Christ has resurrected from the dead, our sins are forgiven. And we love the fact that God has forgiven us of our, of our sins. We love accepting God's forgiveness for our lives, but we pay no mind to the fact that we really suck at forgiving other people. We're just terrible at it. 
We have no problems accepting God's forgiveness of us, but we're terrible at forgiving those who have hurt and wrong us. How is it possible? How is it really possible to be so open to receive God's forgiveness for our broken, dirty, self-centered lives, but we're so unwilling to forgive those that have broken, dirty, self-centered lives? I know forgiveness is a process. I really do. I know that. I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult. It's not easy when an in-law betrays you or hurts you in a deep way. It's not. It's not easy to forgive a person like that. It's not easy to forgive a parent. It's not easy to forgive a relative who has destroyed and abused you physically, sexually, or emotionally. It's not easy to forgive those kinds of folks. It's not easy to forgive or embrace a particular race, a group that has hurt you time and time again. And for you to say, I got to forgive this person and their people again for hurting me. It's not easy to forgive a spouse whom you feel is hurting you over and over again, and they cheat on you with their work. And even if they hurt you, they never have the decency to at least say, will you forgive me for hurting you? It's not easy. It's not easy to forgive an ex who's broken up with you and failed to fulfill the promises that they have promised to live out with you. It's certainly not easy to even forgive a presidential candidate where we feel is a racist, a liar, and they're filled with a whole lot of hate. I've been following some of you on your Facebooks. I am telling you, you're entitled to your opinions, yes. But I warn you to be careful because sometimes your opinions of some of the presidential candidates is bordering on hate. And as a follower of God, we can't do that. Or you're perpetuating greater hate. And we can't do that. It's not easy to forgive people that are willing to take their own lives by putting bombs on their chest and going into public transportation centers and taking the lives of innocent people. It's not easy to forgive people like that. I know it's a process. And that's why today we're starting a new series called The Real F Word, which is a series on forgiveness. You see, we love to receive God's forgiveness. We love it. And on Easter Sunday, we come here, we sing songs, we declare the great grace of God but when it comes to us forgiving people who have hurt us, forgiveness seems like and appears to be a derogatory statement, doesn't it? And we treat it as such. And we know that in one sermon, you're not going to be able to get this. For the next month, the next four weeks, we're going to take you on a journey to help you and I, myself included, to become better forgivers of those who have deeply wounded and hurt us. Because if we don't, then we naturally default to our anger our bitterness, and our natural desire to want to seek revenge. All of you in this room, no matter what, if you've been hurt, your natural reaction is not forgiveness. I promise you that. Your natural reaction is revenge. And it may not be a, a revenge in the sense of malice or you want to kill somebody, right? But it could be just, I'm going to get you. You fired me. Well, I'm a good worker. You're going to regret the day that you did that because you're going to see how much I work at another company and help them to excel. You're going to see what happens. Somebody breaks up with you and says, you know what, I'm just not feeling this anymore. And you're thinking, oh, you're breaking up with me? <laughs> you're going to regret the day that you did that because you're going to realize how good you had it when you were with me. And you're going to live your life even harder. The motivation to want to succeed in everything and meet somebody even better is going, to be, is going to be great for you. You see, we naturally have a desire to want to seek revenge. And, you know, those people that have hurt you, I know they've hurt you and they've destroyed your lives. But the truth is, your anger, your malice, the bitterness that you harbor inside, your desire to want to seek revenge has really ruined you today on this Easter Sunday. It's really ruined the person that you are. You used to be such a beautiful, gentle, loving person. And then something happened. But because you're unwilling to forgive those who've hurt you, you become jaded. And before you get hurt again, your job and your mission in life is to hurt people before they hurt you. And that's just a dangerous place to be. The greatest lie that you can tell yourself is that if you don't forgive someone, you think it's just between you and that person that you don't forgive. It spills over and leaks over into every relationship. And so the, what I want to do today on this Easter Sunday is I want to set up and, and help you to realize, what will your life look like if you refuse to forgive someone? What does our life look like if we decide to seek revenge on those who've deeply hurt us? And how in the world can we do this whole business of forgiving? 
because that's what Easter Sunday is about. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to look at the first 16 verses. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to look at the first 16 verses. The story of Cain and Abel. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. You find the story here of Cain and Abel. When you look at this, you find that Cain is the firstborn. And in the uh, Jewish religion and in the culture, you realize the firstborns are the ones who receive the blessings. They receive uh, the blessings from God. But what you see in Genesis is that the firstborns don't fare very well. We find that in the life with Cain and Abel. We also find that in the life of Isaac and Ishmael. And we find that also in the life of Jacob and Esau. The firstborns, for some reason in Genesis, don't receive the blessings from God. And in this story, you find that Cain and Abel bring God a, an offering, an offering. <laughs> and this offering was very important to both of them because they gave God the very best. Cain attended to vegetables and fruits, and Abel had more of livestock. He was a livestock farmer. Cain was more of a, a vegetable farmer and a fruit farmer. And they bring their gifts, the best of what they had, to God, and God chooses Abel's gift. And you're wondering, why? Why did God choose Abel's gift? Is it because God is a carnivore and he's not a vegetarian? And so he rejected the gift of Cain? No, that's really not the reason. The major reason why God rejected Cain's gift was because his heart was off. His heart was not in the right place. And get me on this, hear me well. No matter how great your offering is to the Lord, even today, if your heart is not in the right place, God will reject it. He will reject it. No matter how great your offering is, it's about your posture and your heart. God warns Cain. He says, check yourself, young man. Check yourself of your heart. And so what does Cain do? He gets so angry and infuriated what happens that God shows his younger brother's gift over his that he takes the life of his own brother as a result of it. Revenge at its deepest, deepest level. And so as a result, what do we learn? What happens when you and I want to seek revenge? What happens when you and I want to bask and soak in our bitterness in our life? There are two things we learn about that. The first is that revenge or that bitterness will always lead to more punishment. Revenge or whatever that bitterness or that sense of wanting to get back or that anger that you have will always lead to more punishment. It will. Many of you think that if you can just seek revenge, you're going to feel so much better. There's going to be this feeling of satisfaction. That's what Cain believed. Cain believed that if he did this, that he believed that if he took the life of his brother, then he would have God's undivided attention. Did it happen? No. It only led to more punishment. So check this out, that if you and I live our lives continuously to want to seek revenge, where you want to just harbor in on the bitterness and the anger that that person has caused you, the hurt, and you get angry about it, you will only reap more punishment for yourself. It's not worth it. And that's what happened to Cain. Cain experienced punishment at its deepest level. And what you need to know about sin is that sin is not about what you do or what you don't do. It's not about right or wrong. Sin, what you need to know, is not you breaking rules. Rather, sin is an aggressive force ready to ambush you in the way it did for Cain. That's what sin is. That's why this stuff is so destructive. If you do not kill sin, can't, sin will kill you. 
And we find that with Cain, that's what happened to him. That sin ended up killing him at the end of the day. That word desire in verse 6 is not normal human yearning. Like some of you say, well, you know, I desire uh, to eat right now because I'm hungry. That's a normal human er uh, yearning. You know what that word desire means in verse 6 in the Hebrew? Dark perversion. Dark perversion. Your desire of bitterness, your desire of revenge, wanting to get back, is a dark perversion. You're playing with a fire that you cannot put out if you continue to dance in that bitterness that you and I have. Just look at the recent events that happened this week on Tuesday. Many of you woke up and you realized what happened that ISIS went, a group of them were in Brussels and they went in there and they attached bombs to themselves and they went into an airport into a subway station and they took the lives of 30 innocent people. Many of you watched with horror, you saw the footage on your phones, online, on, the t on TV, and you realize how broken our world really is. Why did ISIS do this? Because they're seeking revenge against the Western world. That's why. And how did our leaders respond to that? Well, they all said, you know what? We will seek revenge back. And that's sure it becomes a vicious cycle of hate and revenge and punishment and more and more punishment. Even if our world leaders destroys ISIS, another group will form, I promise you. Because hate, revenge, only begets more hate and revenge. I wish our world leaders could do what this man did this week. Can we show that picture to him? If our leaders could learn to do this, to wash the feet of Muslims, kiss their feet, and say, I'm here to serve you, it will create a different kind of an emotion for, other, for terrorists that they will be different. And I look at a picture like that and I realize, when will it ever happen where our world leaders can take on a humble posture like that? Hate begets hate. And if you and I continue to live our lives where we are unwilling to forgive those who've hurt us and we continue to harbor our deep sense of bitterness and anger towards them, it only leads to more punishment. That's the first thing. The second pitfall that happens if you are unwilling to forgive and you seek, for, and you seek revenge in people's lives is that it would lead to an absence from God in your life. It would lead to an absence of God in your life. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So here's what it is. If you are unwilling to forgive, when you want to seek revenge, you become a wanderer for your entire lives until you're willing to forgive. You feel lost today? Do you feel lost? Because I believe the reason why you're lost is because you're unwilling to forgive those who have deeply, deeply wounded you. Resentment is a deadly disease that impacts your life physically, it impacts your life emotionally, and it definitely impacts your life in a spiritual level. Nothing will kill your relationship with God more than the resentment that you may harbor in your life. And listen, you may have 500 friends on your Facebook, you may have 1,000 friends on your Facebook, and you may get along beautifully with all 499 or 999 of those people, all right? If they're just one person that you are unwilling to forgive, we learn in this passage that God will separate himself from us. That there will be a distance between God and us. We learn that from this passage. That there will be an absence from God in our lives. And so this is serious stuff here. Because many of you have been living your life without God for a long time. Even though you've been coming to church, you've been praying. But because you're unwilling to forgive someone, you and God have been separated for a very long time. And please understand, it's not God separating himself for you. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Amen? He's unchanging. So he stays the same. What happens is that when we are unwilling to forgive, when we harbor resentment and revenge, we are creating a greater distance from God, creating barriers before us and God, therefore creating a distance where we no longer are close with God anymore and we're far away from him. And the only way to do battle with this metro is where we can get to a point in our lives where we can say, I'm going to start the process of forgiving someone who has deeply hurt us. What is the definition of forgiveness? I looked at the Webster Dictionary this week and it was horrible definitions. So I came up with my own, all right? Here's 
my definition of forgiveness, I think it's a pretty good one. Here's the definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you wish the person who hurt you well. That's the definition of forgiveness. Is when you wish the person who hurt you well. When you can do that, you've really forgiven someone. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 35. And I want to focus these words on Jesus. And I want you to pay attention to what he teaches us. Because many of you have read this passage. But I don't think you've experienced the weight or the gravitas of what this passage is teaching you today. Look at what it says. It says, verse 21 of chapter 18 of Matthew. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Now you got to realize that Peter was shooting for the stars here. Seven times is a lot for Peter. Think about it. It's a lot for you. Can you forgive your spouse who cheated on you seven times? You said, no, one's enough. Seven. Seven times, right? So Peter was shooting for the stars here. He thought Jesus was going to actually go lower, right? And how does Jesus respond? I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. That means 490 times. Basically what Jesus is saying, he says, there is never an amount you see, you're here on Easter Sunday, and Jesus wants you to know that he doesn't have an amount of how many times he will forgive you for the sins that you've committed against him. There is never an amount for him. And he says, likewise, because I will always forgive you, you have to likewise do the same. And so how does he teach this? Always in a form of a parable. Look at what he says. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was bought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should be paid back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father would treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus is saying, basically, you and I should be so aware of the sins that we have committed and the sins in which God has forgiven us for. That, that when somebody wrongs us, that our natural reaction wouldn't be, oh, man, that's messed up, I'm going to get you back. Our natural reaction should be, man, God has forgiven me so much of my sins, so therefore I should forgive the sin of this person who has harmed me. That should be our response. I stand here before you, and I'm, I'm often, you know, I get nervous before I come up to preach. And today's the same day. I came up here, and I'm just like, God, you know my sins. You know the sins I've committed in the past and in the present. They are much, and there are many but yet God chooses to forgive and his grace continues to flow in my life in a point where he's called me to do things like this. That floors me. And that shouldn't just be something that I say, well, that's great, God. But that means that if somebody has hurt me and will continue, people will always hurt you, that I do my best to forgive that person. That if I don't do that, then I enter into a dark, perverted state of mind. And so what do we learn in this passage about forgiveness. And, and the word forgiveness in the Greek literally means to let go. To let go. Meaning that when you enter into this relationship with this person who has hurt you, you let go of what wrong they've done to you. That you don't allow that to be a part of the relationship anymore. That you let go of it and now you have an opportunity to enter into a deeper relationship with that person. That's what forgiveness means. To let go. All right? And so what do we learn about forgiveness? Or how can you and I begin this process? There are two things you need to know to take this journey to forgive someone, all right? The first is this. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. It is not a feeling. Many of you believe that in order for you to forgive someone who has hurt you, it just has to feel right. You believe that. And so you wait and you say, you know what? I am not going to forgive this person until I feel good about forgiving this person. Listen, if you're going to wait to forgive someone until you feel good about it, you're going to wait a whole long time. 
I promise you. Because you're never going to feel good about forgiving someone. The road to forgiving someone is painful and it's a dreadful reality. It really is. It's not fun. You know what the relief or the good feeling comes is when you forgive that person, then you experience a sense of freedom that you've never experienced before. You see, forgiving someone, understand this, it's not for that person, it's for you. Because if you don't forgive that person, you live as a prisoner to your anger and your hate. The king in this story realized that the servant could not pay the debt he owed. He made a choice, knowing that forgiveness is a choice we make, not a feeling we wait for, right? And that's why he did. When you say to yourself, I can't forgive this person, you're basically just saying, I choose not to forgive this person. Because forgiveness is a choice more than just a feeling. It's easy for us to say, well, God, you know, I couldn't help it. I had to seek revenge and beat this person up because of what they did to me. I had to seek revenge. But think about the glory of a choice, Metro, on this Easter Sunday. You know, the difference between animals and us is because we have been given the freedom to choose. Cats are cats. Bees make honey. They have no other choice. We were created in the image of God because he's afforded us the opportunities to make choices. And the holiest thing that you and I will ever do are the choices that we make. And so when you look at the story of the servant, when you look at the story of Cain and Abel, it isn't a story of moral instructions, Metro. It's not. You know what it's a story of? It's a story of you and I to embrace and reflect upon the enigmatic situations of our life. That our life is a mystery. That many times we go through hardships in our life. And we can't help it. We go through hardships. And rather than focusing on the mystery of what we've gone through in our life, that we would know that what we can do and the only thing that we can control is the choices that we make from the moment that we experience what we've experienced that often seems very painful in our lives. That's the only thing that you and I, and I can control. I couldn't control the fact that my father used to come home when I was a kid, drunk, and he used to beat my mom and my sisters and I. I couldn't control that. Those were the ambiguities of life I had to embrace. And yes, there were moments that when he would beat me and I was getting older and I got so angry and I said, man, you wait till I get older because I'm going to give you a whooping ten times stronger than what you just gave me. There were moments when I was so angry so bitter and wanting to seek revenge in this man who should have loved and cared for me. But later on in life, I chose to forgive this man. And it was the holiest decision I've ever made. You want to know why? Because it led me on a journey to become your pastor. That's why. You have no idea what road you're choosing to forgive someone will lead you today. You have no idea and you just look at the deaths or the bad stuff of what forgiving someone might feel like. But you've got no idea that if you choose to do this today, that you're never more like Jesus Christ. And you have no idea the road that God will call you to take today if you choose to forgive a person who's wronged you. Forgiveness is a choice you make, not a feeling you wait for. Metro. The second thing we learn, and I'm done after this, that we learn about forgiving is that you have to be aware that God's forgiveness is contingent upon your willingness to forgive others. God's forgiveness will never be a part of your life if you are unwilling to forgive those who've hurt you. Look at verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? This is God talking. He's using it in his parable. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. God's forgiveness of our lives must be reflected in our willingness to forgive other people. And that's why Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, he says, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. That's what Jesus says, hey, if you come to the altar and you have an issue with your brother, you got to go and reconcile with that brother before you come back here. Because if you're going to cry out for my love and my forgiveness, it's not going to happen until you can rectify that issue. That's why in the Lord's Prayer it says, forgive us of our sins as we forgive what? Those who have sinned against us. Understand 
that if you experience God's love and his grace and his forgiveness over your life, over your life which is ready and, 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 and they're available for you today, it should impact your heart in such a way on this Easter Sunday where it should soften you to say, I will forgive those who have deeply hurt and wronged me today. You're saying, but you know what? Until they ask for forgiveness, I can't forgive them. Yes, you can. The person doesn't have to ask you to forgive them, for you to forgive them. Because again, it is for you, not for that person. We learned that from Jesus. When those Roman soldiers killed him, when they hung him up on the cross and put nails in his hands and his feet, and he was thriving in agony and pain, those same soldiers were betting of who would get the cloak of Jesus Christ right before his eyes. And what did Jesus say? Did he say, hey, take him out. Daddy, you take him out. How dare they do this after putting me on the cross? What does he say? He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They didn't ask Jesus to forgive. He just prayed and said, God, I forgive them, but will you forgive them for what they are doing to me? That's the Christian response. Let me make this very clear for you, very clear. If you are unwilling to forgive other people today, I know it's a process, but if you're not willing to take that journey, God will not forgive you. That's this message of Easter today. Yes, Jesus Christ has risen and he's conquered death. God has sent his son to die for us on the cross so that we can do away with sin and that that no longer becomes a barrier between us and God anymore. But that means that if you've experienced that favor and that grace, that that should move you and touch you to the point where you say, man, who am I to judge? Because God has forgiven me much more than I will ever forgive a person of. Remember, 10,000 bags of gold compared to 100 pieces of silver coins. That's what we're talking about here. God will never ask you to do something he's never done. Now listen, I just need to say this though. For some of you in this room, more than you forgiving someone, you have to ask people to forgive you because you are the type of person that likes to hurt other people. Now you may not do that maliciously, but you have a natural ability to just hurt and wound people. And I cannot imagine what will happen to you if you continue on that path. Some of you have an amazing ability to just hurt people and offend them. Now listen, truth is truth and truth and love is fine. But some of you share truth to shame and to hurt people. God's mercy will never be there for you if you don't ask those people that you've hurt in that way to forgive you. Married folks, husbands, wives, hear me on this. Don't let silence determine whether you're going to talk again or not. If you've wronged your spouse, have the guts and the courage to say, forgive me for what I have done. Parents, hear me on this. If you've hurt your child because we're going to make mistakes, have the courage and the godliness to go to them and say, son, daughter, would you please forgive me for what I have done? Sons and daughters, if you've hurt your parents, have the decency to go to them and say, Mom, Dad, will you forgive me for what I've done to you? Because if we don't do that, Jesus says, you will never be forgiven. I came back uh, on Monday from Spain. I was in Norway and Spain, and I was in Norway to do some speaking, and uh, I was there for about 36 hours, and I felt really great being amongst the Scandinavians because they're tall, just like me. And so it was really nice. I kind of fit right in. They're like, wow, you're the tallest Korean I've ever seen. I say, yeah, I fit in well with your people. And uh, they were kind enough. My mother and I went out, and, and this was kind of like a, 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 a mom-son kind of a vacation. And after my father passed away, I just said, you know what, I want to take my mom on a vacation, if I can, uh, every so often, because she's getting old. She's in her 70s now. And so uh, they were kind enough to buy us a ticket to go to Madrid. And I wanted to go to Spain because I've heard so many great things about it. Many of you have shared it with me. And uh, their food is amazing, I've heard. And so I went to eat. 
all right? And, uh, but the main reason why I wanted to go is that I had a friend in college. His name is Pepe. And I hadn't seen him in over 20 years. That's why I wanted to go, just to reconnect up with him. And he promised that he would show me around his beautiful country. So he took me to Segovia, showed me around Madrid, took me to some good places to eat. We had a great time. There he is. We haven't seen each other in 20 years, so we got reunited. And we attended a Christian fellowship that was pretty dysfunctional. You talk about emotional unhealthiness, it was probably at its, I've never seen anything worse than that. And it was primarily because of our pastor. Our pastor was an emotional infant, and he hurt a lot of us. And so, I, I, you know, it's been 20 years. I haven't seen Pepe in 20 years. And so it's been so many, it's been two decades. And so I forget the details, all right, because I got a bad memory. And so as we were sitting and as we were talking and during meals, he shared with me openly what had happened. And it was during the time where uh, he f- ran out of money. He was an international student at college, ran out of money, and uh, he decided that it was better for him to go back home. And so he made that decision. Well, our campus pastor confronted him and said, no, you are not to go back. In fact, God told me you are to stay here. And if you disobey him, you are disobeying him, and then we will excommunicate you from our fellowship. So basically threatened him. So he really prayed hard about it because he thought, okay, let me just pray about this, that God, do you want me to stay? Really felt like he needed to move on. And so when he left, he said the most painful thing was is that uh, our college pastor told every single one of us not to drive Pepe to the airport. He's excommunicated. And he said that hurt him the most because he gave his life for this fellowship. He was a leader, disciple people, attended every event, and it just broke his heart that people would treat him like this and that his campus pastor treated him like this. And I didn't remember this, but as he shared it with me, the memory started coming. And I remember just kind of in solidarity because we've all been hurt by him that I just kind of joined him in that. And I just said, wow, it's horrible. The last night he drove me back to our hotel And I just said to him, I said, oh, and mind you, he said that from that point on, when he came back to Spain, he stopped going to church, and he said he's not going to be a Christian anymore. He said if this is what it means to be a follower of God, to hurt people like this who've only done the best they could for a ministry, I don't want anything to do with it. And so he said he's not going to church anymore. So for 20 years, he had not gone to church. And so I felt like it would be a good opportunity for me to pray for him. I said, Pepe, can I pray for you? Do you mind if I do that? And he said, sure. And so I laid hands on him, and I prayed for him in the car. I just said, God bless his family, his business. And then I said, would you please heal his pain from what he experienced from, the college past, from our college pastor? And I said, God, would you just reveal to Pepe right now how much you love and care for him? And after the prayer, I just thought it was a very simple prayer. I looked at him, he was just weeping, he was crying. We hugged, we said our goodbyes, and I know that he's on that journey, and I'm praying that he would forgive I came back to the States, and during my times of prayer, God said to me, he said, Peter, you need to ask Pepe to forgive you because you should have stuck up for him. You were vice president of the fellowship. You should have been strong enough to say, this is messed up. I'm going to take Pepe to the airport. And you know what? If I be excommunicated from this group, then so be it. But I didn't do that because I was weak. And so I felt the brevity that I was part of this as well. And so I emailed him because he was on vacation. He's on holiday. He's coming back tomorrow. And I just said, Pepe, forgive me for what I've done because I should have been stronger and I should have fought for you, but I didn't. I was weak and forgive me. And I'm hoping that he would read that email and respond. Maybe he did, but maybe it opened up some things that he didn't realize. And maybe he's having a hard time responding. Whatever it is, I realized that I hurt him and I had to make it right. But I thought about this for 20 years, two decades, he has separated himself from the presence of God. How many years has it been for you? How many years have you separated yourself from God? How many years have you chosen not to forgive someone who has deeply hurt you? And how many years has that been since you've separated yourself from God? Metro Community Church, on this Easter Sunday, what you need to know is is that forgiveness is not giving those who have hurt you permission to ruin your lives. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness on this Easter Sunday is giving God permission to transform your life today. That's what forgiveness is. And my hope and my prayer is that you will begin the journey today on this Easter Sunday to forgive those in your life who has hurt you. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer.
I'm going to give you a moment to respond to this. But are there people in your life right now that you're struggling to forgive? Can you open your heart right now and say, God, help me to begin that journey? Now, some of you are here today because somebody invited you. It's Easter. And maybe you've never opened your heart and never received God's forgiveness for your life. And if that's you and you've never done this, maybe you've come to church here and there, but you've never committed yourself to Jesus Christ. But there's something that you're experiencing today that you know is from God and not from you. I want to give you an opportunity to make this decision right where you are. This has eternal ramifications for you. If you want to dedicate your life to God and receive God's forgiveness for your life by believing in his son, Jesus Christ, that 2,000 years ago he came, lived on this earth, died and rose again from the dead. If you want that Christ to be a part of your life, say this prayer where you are, silently where you are. Lord Jesus, I open my heart and my life to you and I receive your forgiveness for my life, my brokenness. And I ask you, God, that you would help me to receive that grace and mercy so that I can release that grace and mercy to those who have wronged me as well. If you've prayed that prayer, there's a celebration happening in heaven right now. Now for those in this room, maybe you're like the prodigal son and you've run away from God and this is your opportunity now to come back to him. And the only way you're really gonna be able to do that is if you're gonna be able to forgive or ask for forgiveness. And maybe for some of you in this room, you hate your father, you hate your mother because they abandon you. Maybe you don't even know what that feels like anymore because you had to shut down emotionally. Or you hate an ex who deeply betrayed you, a friend who stole from you. The way you come back to the father's arms is if you take that journey and say, I'm gonna start the process, God. And whoever their name is right now, I don't want you to say it out loud, but just say it to God. Just share their name with God and say, God, help me to forgive this person today. Silently where you are. And help me to come back to your house to experience your love, your mercy, and your grace upon my life. Lord, we're terrible at this. And God, I would say that it wasn't easy for you because your son had to come and die for us on the cross, resurrect from the dead so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Would you help us? I pray for every person in this room, God, who said yes to you for the very first time. I pray you bless them. I pray you strengthen them and empower them, God, to live passionately for you. And God, that they will be so great at forgiving those who've wronged them. And I pray for those who've renewed their faith in you. God, that you would help them because this is not easy but let them take the step as they experience your favor, your grace upon their life. May they, God, at this point in their life, realize that forgiveness is a choice they make, not a feeling they wait for. And I pray that they would be able to forgive the person who has wronged them. In your name I pray, amen. Let's flip over our communication card because we'll pray for you this week. This is your next step. Let's flip this over. Let God speak to you. If you've never committed your life to Jesus and you've done that today, would you check that off for the first time? Check it off and go visit the next table, which is outside the building to your right. To your right. Pastor David Hosang and his pastors will be out there to pray for you and support you during this time. All right. Second step, you will ask someone that you've hurt this week to forgive you. Ask someone that you've hurt to forgive you this week. Sec third, you will confront and share with the person who has hurt you. Sit down and say, you've hurt me of what you did or what you said to me. All right? So share, be open. Let that forgiveness process begin. That could be a huge process for you. The last thing, because this is a big topic, will you attend, especially for your first-time visitors, I will attend Metro for the entire forgiveness series for the next month at Metro Community Church so that you can learn to become a forgiver because God has forgiven you. A couple quick announcements. If you're a newcomer, uh, please meet us back at the Newcomers Quick Stop. Love to give you a free gift before we leave, before you leave. And then uh, next week, uh, the first Sunday of April, just want to remind you, we go three services, 9-15, 11-15, 1-15. Please make a note of it. 9-15, 11-15, 1-15. Please let your friends know as well. 
And lastly, uh, Chuhi, one of our members of our church, baked cookies for all of you. And uh, the cookies are called red cookies. And it really represents resurrection, the blood of Jesus. They're delicious. Can you just please make sure you eat a couple, grab some before you leave, and grab a bottle of water before you do that. Now it's our time to respond. And I didn't do this in the first service. But, you know, come forward to the altar if you'd like to experience a deeper sense of what God wants to do in your heart to forgive uh, maybe the people that you're struggling to forgive today. And then experience God in worship as the worship team leads you in some amazing songs of worship today. But we also get to respond to God by the giving of our offering. If this is your first time, let this be your offering to us, our communication card. Don't feel obligated to give. This is for people called Metro Their Home. If this is your church, I hope you would give extravagantly because God has given you everything. All right, you can give by credit card and debit card right outside these doors at the welcome table if you didn't bring cash or a check. Let us rise. Ushers, come forward for those who want to receive God in a deeper way. Come to the altar, kneel, worship, pray, and experience God in a powerful way. All right, Metro, as we continue to worship together, after this message, maybe there's someone you have in mind that you want to forgive, or maybe that person is yourself. Uh, so as we sing this song, let's just reflect upon the words, and um, I pray that God would help us to forgive one another. Here we go. Maybe there's something she said, I can't believe what he did, oh, don't they know it's wrong, don't they know it's wrong. Yeah, maybe there's something I missed. How could they treat me like this? It's wearing out my heart. The way they disregard. Yeah, this is love. This is hate. We all have a choice to make. And so, oh, Father, won't you forgive them? They don't know what they've been doing. So, Father, give me grace to forgive them, cause I feel like the one losing. Let's put our hands together. It's only the dead that can live, but still I wrestle with this to lose the pain inside. Times seven times, yeah. Lord, it doesn't feel right for me to turn a blind eye, and I guess it's not that much when I think of what you've done, yeah. This is love, this is hate. See, we got a choice to make, say, oh, Father, won't you forgive them? They don't know what they've been doing. And so, Father, won't you forgive them? Cause I feel like the one losing. Oh no. Why do they think that hate's gonna change their heart? We're up in arms over wars, don't need to be fought. Freedom comes and we cement. We build our bridges up, but just to run them down.
Metro. So with forgiveness is a choice and not a feeling. That we actually give God the glory by allowing the power of his love and his saving grace to change us, to purge us, to cleanse us, and to enable us to forgive. By doing so, we give him the glory. Amen. And just this moment, I would like to take the time to give him glory for three special people who are here. I don't want to embarrass them. Um, but we have two Metro Lifers here, you guys. Can we give God the glory for that? <laughs> Claudia Aiken and Sean Samuel. And we have Miss Nicole Cartwright who picked them up and brought them here. So we would like to give her a round of applause as well. God bless you. This is why I give God the glory. And I pray that you do as well. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, and Lord, please hear my heart's cry, I'm desperately waiting to be where you are, I'll cross the highest desert. Travel near or far for your glory. I would do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king for your glory. Your glory. I would do. Just to see you, to behold you as my King. Sing with me. God send your glory down. Send the wind of refreshing. God send your spirit. Send the wind of refreshing. God send your glory down. Send the wind of refreshing. God send your spirit.
I would do anything just to see you, to behold you as my King. Sing with me, Metro. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus saves. Jesus saves from the cross.
Jesus saves. Let's whisper it. Say Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus saves. Say Jesus saves. My Jesus saves. My Jesus, he still saves. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus. my God saved. If you Jesus saves, somebody make some noise in this place. No, I said if you Jesus saves, make some noise in this place. Well, this is our last song. We want to party. Anybody want to party before we get out of here? Anybody want to party if you want to get out of here? Come on, I need some people to stand right here. Because we're going to say risen. Our God is risen from the dead. Come on, y'all. Put your hands together. You can if you want to. Here we go. Risen. He is risen.
for this worship encounter that we encountered today. God, we thank you for the families that were invited. Father God, we pray that their souls were encouraged. Someone got saved today, Father God. Somebody was stirred up in your spirit. So God, we're asking that you bless us wherever we may go when we leave this place. Bless us, but never, we'll never leave your presence. God, we thank you for all your bountiful things that you're about to do in our lives. Father God, we thank you because when we come back next week, at Metro, we're gonna come back restored, revived, and forgiven. Hallelujah! Because God, you are risen just like you said you would do. So, God, we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. amen. Come on, shout like you mean, Amen. amen. Metro, you are dismissed. Come on, everybody say, Amen.